the learning curve for us has been enormous. Oh, f no, I'm f God f son of a. F we just promised a couple of thousand people on the internet that we'd make something for them. I was like, f it, let's just see what happens. There's no existing models of how to create something like this. One day you just wake up and realize video games can take you to more places than battlefields and fantasy lands. I think it's one of those things that's going to be able to change the planet. Oh, that looks awesome! Let's start the show! Bienvenidos a Cord Killers, our mission to report the intel from the front lines of the cord cutting revolution so you, my friends, have the information you need to be able to watch what you want, when you want, where you want, on whatever device you want. I'm Tom Merritt. Hey. He is Brian Brushwood. That's right. And more importantly, that documentary is, is part of a series, right, Bryce? Brought to, uh, uh, partly written by our friend Anthony Carboni? Yeah, this is called Screenland. It's out now on Red Bull.tv and it's supposed to be on Hulu. Uh, and it's about games and tech culture. It's got stories on man versus game and his comeback to Twitch after his his very public uh, outing of of being drug addicted. Yeah, Samus, sure. the nerdcore rapper Samus. On oh my god! No, I saw, I saw Samus live. She's fantastic. Uh, the brothers Chaps, the Homestar Runner guys. Oh my god! Uh, Homestar Runner big, big stories on on here. So that's uh, Screenland. Check it out. And uh, well, I'll yeah. tell you who would love Screenland, Brian. Hmm. Me? Today's guest, oh. Richard Gunther, editor at the Digital Media Zone <laughs> at thedigitalmediazone.com. How's it going, Richard? It's going great. How are you guys doing? Dude, thank you so much for joining us, Richard. So on a scale of one to kangaroo, how excited are you, buddy? I'm very excited. Pretty kangaroo, actually. <laughs> like, like maybe uh, maybe occasionally using the four paws, but mainly <laughs> hopping. That's how, that's yeah. how excited. <laughs> He's out of pocket, as they say. Oh... Uh, 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 yeah, so Richard, uh, you cover uh, a lot of smart home stuff, which obviously touches on cord cutting devices. Uh, and, and also you do a, a show specifically uh, about watching entertainment in the Microsoft world. I do. And we cover, surprisingly, at the Digital Media Zone, a lot of digital media topics, kind of uh, a lot of what you talk about here. So I'm glad to be on with you guys tonight. Yeah, it's good to have you along, man. Uh, well, let's get right into our primary target. Well, let's be honest. Hulu needs a hit. They've they've got some some Tom, cult following. Tom, they, already, they already had their hit. It was eleven twenty two sixty three. Well, didn't... no, I I think I think some of their other shows are even bigger. Wah, wah. Frankly, <laughs> no, no, they had their hit. It was the one about the dude who worked for Death or something. Or uh, yeah, get, I don't know if therapy. people even associate that with Hulu anymore, uh, right? Um, like it's the over. problem is. Over. They need a big. They need a bigger Kevin show. Kevin Smith's so. spoilers, huge, huge. What's the one with uh, Jesse Pinkman? Uh, the path. The path. No, the that's what show. it's called. It's called the one with Jesse Pinkman. <laughs> right. Yeah. So there's your problem. Right. Whose solution might be an adaptation of Joe Hill's Lock and Key? Hulu has ordered a pilot. Scott Derrickson, director of Doctor Strange, uh -oh. is on board to direct. Derrickson would direct multiple episodes of the series in addition to the pilot. Uh, of course, he would have to get back to more movies eventually, so he wouldn't do all of them. But he's heavily involved. And Carlton Cuse, which you might know from Colony or The Strain or Bates Motel, but I think of mostly in regards to Lost, will be the showrunner. So top showrunner, top director, top quality piece of writing, Brian, with Lock and Key, the graphic novel. What's th This is it, right? This is going to save Hulu. All right, Tom. Normally, this is where I'm all bluff and bluster and I make a bunch of jokes, but <laughs> I think of everyone here on the panel, lock and key is very, very precious to me. So I'm going to defer to listen to you guys talk about what you think before I chime in on this. Yeah, now I'm curious, uh, Richard, if you're familiar with the lock and key series. No, I've actually never heard of this, which I'm embarrassed to admit. Okay, well, don't be, because you're probably not alone, but you <laughs> should go read it uh, as as evidenced if you can see Brian's face right now. Uh, oh, I saw. It is a fantastic series. Joe Hill, of course, Stephen King's son. Uh, it is a great macabre adventure. I don't want to even say much about it for, for fear of spoiling it, but it is an excellent story. It is an excellent mystery, an excellent horror story, uh, and... Does before we get into whether it should be made, does that just does that sound all of these names attached, that kind of premise attached? Does that sound interesting? Would that make you watch Hulu? 
more. Yeah, I mean, this sounds like a good formula, right? It, on paper, it sounds really good. It's all the right people. It's all the right angles. Will it get me to watch it, even though I don't know it? Yeah, probably. Would it get me to subscribe to Hulu if I didn't have Hulu? Eh, it's a harder call. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, first of all, let me give you guys some background. If you have not heard the good word of lock and key, then I implore you to experience normally both justin robert young and i are very big fans of 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 watch the movie first then read the book if you like the movie then you're just going to like the book more it's going to give you more of what you liked in the movie but um lock and key is is uh extraordinary because joe hill has learned from his dad um uh in I, none of this is a spoiler, but in Lock and Key, you get these echoes of things that Stephen King is very, very good at. He's good at, um, you know, when you look at a story like It, themes of uh, the sins of the parents being visited on the children. You know, uh, in The Shining, he's um, he's good at places that feel alive in their own unique ways. He's good at um, that magical uh, transition that happens between being a kid and being an adult and how so much of what made you a kid just gets forgotten in the ether. And along the way, uh, in in Lock and Key, the graphic novel, and if you just want to dive in, I, I implore you, dive all the way in, just buy the complete graphic novel on Amazon or something. Uh, the artwork is exquisite. It conveys so, so much. Um, it's It's wonderful. Now, having said that, this is coming from somebody who loves the story and loves the storytelling deeply. And by the way, uh, as much as I love Stephen King, I'll be the first to admit, very Stephen King tends to be better at beginnings than endings. Would you say that's fair, Tom? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that is, you know, one one of his strongest points is he'll draw you into a story and make you want to know the mystery. If he fails, it's because the mystery was not explained very well or at all. Correct, correct. <laughs> he's like, he's like uh, and then, hey, look, a bunny. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but but uh, having said that, uh, lock and key more than any of, of, of Stephen King's works, and again, it's not Stephen King, it's his son, Joe Hill, who's his own person, um, that story sticks the landing in a very deeply satisfying way for me. Um, having said that, Lock and Key has been adapted a number of different ways. Do you even remember this, Tom? Do you remember the uh, the, the the pilot that was put together for the 2001 yeah. version? This was before I had read it. I remember people being very excited about this, you included. Yeah, and what, and, and what did you think just kind of looking at it? <laughs> I didn't know what to think at all. It it looked it just looked like a horror story. There is so much that is so nuanced and so um, uh, ephemeral about this story that I worry about its ability to be translated into uh, meat puppet phenomenon. Um, and and by the way, keep in mind this comes from somebody who deeply loved um, the, uh, Audible did a presentation of this with a massive cast. It was an it was an audio drama. Uh, of Lock and Key with like 32 cast members, including Captain Janeway and uh, and and, and uh, I, I want to say like, oh, it wasn't Will Wheaton, but it was somebody just like him uh, <laughs> that shows up at some point. And uh, and it was really really good um, uh, for what it was. Do you mean Haley Joel Osment? Yeah, that's the one. Oh, okay. <laughs> Pretty much the same. <laughs> just like him, Tatiana um, Maslany. Yeah. But but my point is. Um, I enjoyed it because I had all the rich visuals of the comic book, uh, of, of the graphic novel in my head. I question whether or not anybody who just experienced the audio, audio book uh, got as rich an experience as I did. And if so, please, please write us. If you experienced Lock and Key in any format besides the original graphic novel, please share with us how it landed because this is what I worry about. This is, this is a difficult story to translate. This all rests on Carlton Cuse uh, and the writers he gets to create his episodes because I feel like it could be done, but it takes somebody who really grasps what makes the graphic novel special and knows when to tweak it and when not to for television uh, and involving Joe Hill in those decisions in a way that that will allow Joe to understand when it's appropriate for him to say no and when TV dictates that it that it has to change. The Expanse being a great example of that being done right now, where you have a TV team that has grasped what was good about the novels and is making an excellent TV show in cooperation with the authors. 
Yeah, and specifically, and now now here's now now let me pivot everything around and tell you the upside of everything. Scott Derrickson. Scott Derrickson did the impossible. He took the most ephemeral, esoteric, most heady, psychedelic, uh, insane, art-driven uh, 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 concept uh, with Doctor Strange and in cooperation with C. C Robert Cargill made the best, the, the best single, uh, the, the best introductory Marvel movie since Iron Man. I think that's fair to say, right? With, Probably. With Doctor yeah, I think it's fair. Yeah. Richard? Uh, and so, and and plus, uh, uh, from what I know, I know I know Cargill's friendly with Joe Hill. I mean, he's talked about the two of them hanging out. Wouldn't it be amazing if 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 essentially the Doctor Strange treatment came to lock and key? And if anyone could do it, it just seems like that crowd. I mean, what did I just say? It rests on Carlton Cues to get the right writers. What did you just say, Scott Derrickson, in partnership with C. Robert Cargill, last week's guest? <laughs> was able to make Doctor Strange happen in a way that people didn't think was possible to happen. I mean, do the math, right? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. And, and this is pure rampant speculation totally, on my part. Totally. But it just seems like that strata, that cloud, that 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 bubble of talent and and ferocity if anyone can pull this off, I, I feel like that crowd would be able to do it. Now would you subscribe to Hulu for this if you hadn't before? <laughs> Me? No, Richard. Yeah. Uh oh. Richard's speech. As you know, I subscribe to everything. So you know, right. I'm gonna watch it. It would be have to be a hypothetical universe in that case. <laughs> uh well, I I I think this is this is the kind of bet they have to make, right? They have to find something that is beloved, put the put the firepower behind it, and hope they capture lightning in a bottle. Yep. What we captured here was our own hearts, which we didn't think we had <laughs> until you all poured out the love upon them at patreon.com slash court killers. For the record, this is the worst Dr. Seuss novel I've ever read. <laughs> we captured our own hearts that we didn't know we had until you poured them out on us. <laughs> yes. The love you gave us at patreon.com slash court killers has made our hearts grow 10 sizes over the past several years. Also and it means we keep <laughs> being able to do the show. Also, I love the fact that I thought that uh, Dr. Seuss wrote a novel. <laughs> 600 Which pages. will be a Adapted as the next Hulu hit, uh, and we will report on it right here because you are willing to support the show. Thank you for doing so. Yeah, absolutely, guys. You guys keep us loud, live, and independent. We can't thank you enough. Let's move on to how to watch. So uh, a couple of things here to talk about today. Sources are telling TechCrunch that Hulu is telling its own staff to prepare for the launch of the Hulu Live TV streaming service in the first week of May. Now, there's a lot to parse here. It may be they're saying first week of May is when launch preparation begins uh, with the consumers not able to get it until mid-May or even late May. The new service is supposed to launch soon, though, so this, this seems like it's probably real. And will launch with a new overall design for Hulu. So even if you're not into the live TV part, they're going to have an overhaul of the Hulu interface for all Hulu users. Uh, Fortune Magazine did a big profile on Hulu this week. Users don't need to know networks, they say. And they talk to a lot of networks to find out how the networks feel about that. And the networks have mixed feelings, but they sort of understand that, like, yeah, people just want to watch CSI or 30 Rock or whatever it is they're watching. They, they know who we are now, but they don't really need to know that. So networks are starting to realize we're just going to have to get used to that and figure out how to rework our branding within that new reality. But Hulu is going full force into, we just want to put the shows you want to watch in front of you. The interface should make it easy to get to those shows. And we'll even do things like notifications so that when live stuff is happening, you find out in time to be able to turn it on. Dude, uh, uh, Richard, uh, let me hand it over to you. How, how many... How many services are you subscribed to? And do you feel what I feel, which is this general anxiety about more and more options? Because my impulse is to just totally, um, totally just cancel everything, like like make a quarterly habit of canceling everything full stop and waiting until there's something you want to see before resubscribing. Wow. Well, I subscribe to pretty much most of 
the online services that are the popular ones. Netflix, Hulu, Vudu. Well, Vudu isn't a subscription, but I, I mean, I'm, I'm using most of them. And a lot of it's because everything isn't all in one place. And I want access to everything. I was joking with Tom earlier that I'm not a cord killer. I'm a cord everywhere. I have pretty much every premium service you can get because I want every option that I have for content. And so for me, like, I love that Hulu is doing this. I love that Hulu is getting into this space, but uh, this concerns me in a variety of ways. Like one, I, I think it makes sense to forget about the network when you're talking about on-demand content because you don't associate with a network. But with linear content, with content that you're watching in a live fashion, I've used multiple services to try to not present it as a network, and it's confusing, and I just haven't been able to like wrap my head around that yet. Dude, I, uh, I have a confession to make. I, I for the first time have succumbed to my the, the the very thing I've warned myself about I finally did which is I forgot that I had Sling TV I forgot that Sling TV updated so that you could watch on demand uh and I bought the full season this this third season of Better Call Saul I paid for and then and then after paying for it I went and watched it live I'm like oh it's live I'm on Sling TV and then the next morning I got an email from Amazon saying like hey since you bought the season of Better Call Saul there's a new episode out I was like oh I watched it last night I'm paying for too many services and I yeah. felt dumb Yeah Yeah I get that completely and that's part of the problem that Roku is trying to solve that Apple is trying to solve with their just not there yet TV app that is definitely a problem is the proliferation proliferation of content across services how do you get at it at the in the way that makes the most sense to you you know what i kind of want to i i don't know that i want to proclaim it now but can, can we can we maybe and forgive me for blue sky in here tom but can we put together like a one date where all of us agree to kind of like we did the chicken challenge let's let's pick a date and on that date all of us unsubscribe from everything and then on Twitter, using some hashtag like, uh, 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 you know, unsub purge or something like that, we uh, we we admit like 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 you know I unsub purged, and then we see you know everybody just unsubs everything, and then the moment the rules are the moment you want to see anything, if something's coming out tonight, you're like okay it's Game of Thrones, I'm not gonna get it anywhere else, so I'm gonna subscribe. Then so you you're like you're like resubbed to HBO now. Uh, hashtag unsub purge or something like that. Would that? Would I mean, that I, what I love about this idea is this is a a relevant idea ten years ago, right? You can't do that. You but can't you, just un. You there's one <laughs> thing you can choose from: cable or not cable. And when you re, you know, now it's a thing you you really seriously have to think about and be like, oh, you know what? What am I sub subscribed to that I forgot about? Uh, and and I love this idea of just cleaning house. And saying when I get to the need to watch something, then I will subscribe to that thing. So one week from now is May first. Do we want to declare May International 1st? Workers Day? Yes, uh, yes, <laughs> yes. So for the proletariat, uh, shall we encourage them all? Uh, do you want to declare May first as Unsub Purge Day? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, okay, all right. So our so, new national holiday, and we can revisit it every year. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So so uh, Mayday, Mayday! I'm unsub purging. Is what we'll say. Uh, I love it. But 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 again, like I think it'll be fascinating to see how many people just unsubscribe to everything, and then and then just to watch what we resubscribe to first, right? So so when you come back, you'll you say you know like uh, uh, I today I resubscribe or or just I subscribed to HBO now because I have to see blank or whatever yeah. whatever it is. The 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 difficult the difficult folks are going to be the ones who got the $35 special deal on direct TV. Now, if those people are still around, I'm not saying everybody has right? to participate. I'm, I'm saying that enough but, people have to participate for it to be interesting for us yeah, to, to watch but the if, unfolding. If you're looking at it as Brian was like, wait, how many things am I subscribed to? I can't even keep track. I don't Just even do know. it. Yep. Clean it up. Uh, now, now I will, I will say that the only thing I will not unsub from is Vimeo because we host so many of our, uh, scam stuff are, are professional well, content yeah, that's on fair. there. That's yeah. a work thing. Right? But, but, yeah. but I think yeah. everything else is fair game. I think I'm going to unsubscribe from it all. Well, maybe not Netflix. 
Yeah, the, and the maybe not like Amazon is, Prime. <laughs> but but that's the thing. It's like is if you know you watch like I know I watch Netflix. Yes. Do, do you just have never unsubs? I'm, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say that for me, Here? my never unsubs will be Vimeo. I uh, because for, uh, uh, for professional reasons sure. and Amazon Prime because I you can't because I've already prepaid it's for contract. the year and I need the shipping uh, and and Netflix because well I I, I think don't... I think with things like Netflix what you can say is like well I've already paid for the month yeah if I never watch Netflix again by the end of May oh. then I'll unsub it but if I watch it once then I keep it that's pretty good. That's a good yeah. idea. Ooh. Also, Strengths points out, great idea. Let's follow through with every Patreon sub. Don't do that for Cord Killers. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, definitely not. Definitely not. Yeah, you, know, you know, what worries me about this is that signing up and unsubscribing are pretty painless. But if you and your household watch these on televisions throughout your home, getting the activated signal to your different television devices is kind of a pain in the butt. So I wonder if we're going to have a lot of people yelling in their households or responding to yelling in their households by May 2nd, what happened to Hulu or whatever else? Yeah. Cause subscribing and unsubscribing isn't the, isn't the problem. It's logging in. <laughs> Right. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. You, you know what? That's good hygiene anyway. You probably need to change that password. Anywho. Uh, <laughs> there you dude, go. I, I'll be fascinated to see who saves money, who ha finds it agonizing, and, uh, and how many people change their password. Now, the good news is nobody watches on televisions anymore anyway. According to Accenture's 2017 Digital Consumer Survey, the percentage of people who say they prefer watching television shows on an actual television fell 55%. Last year, when they asked folks, 52% said, I prefer it on a TV. This year, 23% said they preferred on a TV. Laptops and desktops, they count that all together as one category, are now the most popular stated preference at 42%. And 13% said they prefer watching on a smartphone. Uh, if you dig into the numbers, they break it down into countries. For instance, India had one of the sharpest drops from 47% saying they prefer television to 10%. Uh, the U.S. fell from 59% to 25%. U.K., about the same, 56% to 25%. I am a little, always a little skeptical of huge drops like this without some mitigating explanation. And it's not like suddenly we got all of the television on our laptops and desktops. But I, I am willing to believe that the number of people who prefer to watch on TV is declining. Yeah, yeah, Richard sounded, uh, you know, from from our chit chat on on, on email. You seem surprised <laughs> slash possibly horrified by this. Yeah, I just have one thing to say: get off my lawn, or maybe more appropriately, get off my couch. I'm staying there with my remote in hand. I I have a hard time believing this. This drop is dramatic, and the only thing that I can see in the explanation of how they did the survey is that this is, by the nature of the survey itself, only talking to people who are online. So you have a lot of people, maybe, I don't want to make mass assumptions, but I'm getting up there in years, so I'll do it anyway. Seniors who don't necessarily have online access, who aren't really going to be watching something on a laptop, who still prefer to watch things on a television that aren't even captured in this data. And, and I don't think I fall into that category because I watch stuff everywhere, but man, I would still love to just flop on the sofa with my remote and watch stuff on the big screen. And I just, I, as much as I have no problem watching something on my phone or on my tablet, it's not my preferred method and I just don't get it. I'm old. Well, you know who's not old? Brian Brushwood. Well, I he mean, hates television. I really He took do. a four-barrel shotgun to his television. Well, uh, not quite. I, I, I totally did. Uh, so here, here's my theory. Number one, I, I don't know that anecdotally you're uh, – it may, be, it may be that you're correct about the people not online, you know, watching it alone in their, their uh, uh, geriatric uh, retirement rooms. Um, but <laughs> – 
But uh, here's what I honestly think's happen- think happened is the image of everybody gathering around together at the family uh, to watch in the living room. That was an artifact of very poor bandwidth. It used to be that there was one screen in the house. So everybody gathered around the screen. The screen wanted to maximize the number of eyeballs. So they distributed lowest common denominator, whitewashed, uh, uh, beige as hell programming uh, all the way you know, through the 80s until cable came along around this time. Perfect strangers. Two screens. Yeah. Yeah, and and so and so you would start watching uh, on two different television. Oftentimes, the kids watching one set of program, the parents watching another. But now we live in an age where not only um, are there enough screens to accommodate as many different people as they want, there is a, a variety of entertainment to satisfy the needs of every demographic in the house, and the fidelity of presentation is is equally superior throughout the house. Um, I. It is very problematic for us to watch anything on on our one actual television in the house. We have one television in the house. It is mostly dominated by the children, mostly watching Netflix. There is one program week over week that we watch, and we gather once a week to watch Voltron because it is, because it is the one thing that all five members of our family can kind of enjoy. None of us love it. Uh, we all like it, and it's pleasant for us to all be in the same place at the same time. Now, the <laughs> moment we can, we all scurry to our individual individual televisions and so on, and we all watch content that uniquely speaks to us. There's stuff that I can watch that Bonnie doesn't like to watch. There's stuff that I could, I, I, I'd rather stab my eyeballs out than watch that Bonnie watches, and the kids all have their iPads. To me, this number sounds 100% real, and there ain't nothing wrong with it. You, first of all, need to buy some more televisions. <laughs> actually, <laughs> actually, though, I mean, you have a television in the studio that, you, that you're well, looking I at mean, right I now. Mean, you I, just don't really use it as television. It's a big old monitor. Correct, correct. All of them are monitors. I mean, we have, um, uh, you know, downstairs in the office, we got this nice rumbling subwoofer, stereo speakers, 37-inch, yeah, yeah. 1080p display. That's technically a desktop PC. So if I was taking this survey, I'd say, like, yeah, that's where we retreat to watch Game of Thrones so the rest of the house doesn't hear it. Meanwhile, if we watch anything in the living room the whole house hears it and so you know i don't want to have to explain incest to my i'm kind of right between you guys most of the time i like to watch the tv on the tv especially if eileen and i are watching something together because it's a nice big 65 inch television right uh and it gives me decent sound and all of that but when i'm alone or when eileen's watching the voice i often have to find another way to watch things and so i do watch things on the laptop on my tablet and even occasionally on my phone and What's what I found hilarious, and this is just silly, but I'm going to admit it. I will watch TV on my phone in the bedroom, which has a television in it, because I just don't want to pull out the remotes and my phone's there. I don't want to get up and go in the other room and get a tablet, which has a bigger screen or my laptop. I don't want to mess with all the remotes and turn on the television. Then I have to remember to turn it off when I'm tired. It's just easy to just have that screen. And when it's close to my face, it's kind of like a big screen. And then when I'm done, I just press the button to put it back on the home screen and go to sleep. Tom, would you say that when given the choice, you choose the lower fidelity choice because it's more Yeah. You know, the way I would put it, Brian, is that convenience Clinton's fidelity. No. Okay. Well, no, that would imply that convenience loses to fidelity. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's got to be that convenience trumps oh. fidelity. <laughs> oh, I see. I see. Okay. <laughs> Never mind. Didn't mean to, to confuse things there. No, it's a- exactly. Sometimes I do want the fidelity, though. Sometimes I will find myself like, oh, no, I'm going I'm going to watch this. I'm going to save this to watch on. the. I want to watch the expanse on the television. Right. Because I want to see all those big space scenes on the big old television. So it kind of depends on what I'm watching and, and why I'm watching it. Well, okay. So, so given what you've heard, Richard, uh, do do you find the figure just as unbelievable right now, or or do you do you feel like maybe it's true? I'm still not convinced. I, you know, I don't know. I, I know that more and more people are watching on smaller devices, and I get that, and I I do that myself occasionally. I'm like I said, I just have the old guy's perspective. I still use physical media, and we can talk about that later. Well, no, 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 but, but, but like, like I, I would say as a percentage, less than 1% of all my media consumption is on a traditional television. What, 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 as a percentage, what would you say, Tom? I'd say probably 64% is on a traditional television. Wow. That's way more than I would expect. 
Are, and you're including all the YouTube clips you watch and all the the, the keynotes watch a whole and the lot of YouTube clips, and... actually. Oh, and by the way, this survey was specifically about shows. When they when they they actually had some separate numbers broken out for clips, and they said when you're talking about short clips, it definitely is the smartphone leading the way. Wow. Well, right on. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll, t I'll tell you what. Everybody write us in at cordkillers at gmail.com. We want to hear from you guys. Let's talk about what to watch on whatever screen you want to watch it on in Under Surveillance. Like you, it's all about location, location, location. Under surveillance. You know, I do like myself a period piece, and I've been longing for a simpler time when I used MySpace in a palm trio, and thankfully Netflix has satisfied that urge with Girl Boss. That came out April 21st. It's a 13-episode series loosely based on Sofia Amoroso, the founder and former CEO of the women's clothing retailer Nasty Gal, set in 2005 as she uses her iMac to launch her empire online. Oh, man. I just realized 2005 is a retro piece. I know. Right? <laughs> that ain't right. It's crazy. Uh. They, had, they had Reddit then. Did, uh, uh, did you watch this, uh, Bryce? No, I've been meaning to. It looks interesting. Actually. Okay, all yeah. right. And, and and by the way, I only asked that because you had mentioned it before. I did. Yeah. yeah. No, it's not. No, it's not talk. not not typecasting <laughs> or anything. All right. A couple things uh, coming up. HBO is making a feature length movie adaptation of Fahrenheit four five one. It'll be directed by Ramin Bahrani and co starring Michael B. Jordan. You may know Mr. Jordan as Black Panther or from Creed, uh, and also Michael Shannon, who was in The Man of Steel as Zod. Yeah, he was also yeah. the he was also the guy uh, uh, in. Uh, uh, Boardwalk Empire, who is trying to hunt down, uh, right? Uh, nu nu Nucky. Nu uh, well, and Michael Jordan, Michael B. Jordan was in uh, Friday Night Lights too. Oh, uh, oh, yes, of course, of course. Vince. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Uh, and finally, Netflix is planning to make twenty episodes of Carmen San Diego, some show. I don't know where in the world. Maybe I, they haven't said that, but they have said that Gina Rodriguez from Jane the Virgin is going to be the voice. Uh, that's good. Have you, uh, somebody recently sent me, sorry, this is a tangent, total tangent, feel free to skip. Um, uh, real quick, without looking, uh, you're, I feel like you're looking. Uh, what, what, what color is Carmen San Diego's outfit? I only, I, I'm not, Richard, do you know? Come on, do you not know this? Yes, she wears red. Okay. Yeah. Tom? I wouldn't have known that before reading this article from Engadget and writing up the, piece for us today yeah. where the Engadget author made a big deal about hopefully that uh, Gina Rodriguez wears a red coat while she records the voiceover. Okay, well, so th uh, the reason I ask is because there's been some articles on the the the, the, the Mandela effect, you know, the, the stuff we misremember, and apparently some people are so uncomfortable with the idea that we don't remember things correctly, that they've postulated that uh, that in fact we are from an alternate timeline. <laughs> And that and that that's why we remember her wearing yellow. Whereas meanwhile, there's a much simpler explanation, which is they're remembering the cartoon marketing for Dick Tracy from the late '80s around the same time. Uh, anyway, yeah. Ah, well, there's also interesting, that interesting that movie with Sinbad that isn't actually a movie. Cor cor correct. Uh, it's uh, Kazam. Yeah, they think it's uh, there's a movie called Shazam, but it's Shaquille O'Neal and Kazam. But yeah. Anyway, I but but I I I find it so fascinating that humans are so uncomfortable with the idea that memory is unreliable that they would rather build this fantasy that we're that we've shifted timelines from a different timeline where other things were true. Right, and <laughs> there's so many other indicators of shifting timelines. Now that isn't one of them. Uh, okay. All right. Let's keep. Moving. <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, let's talk about what we're watching. Uh, as long as we're all in the same timeline, at least we could compare notes here. Richard, what do you what's been filling your big old TV screen lately? Oh man, you know I watch so much television, it is crazy. Oh, and by the way, I watch most of that on my television, for what it's worth. So <laughs> I have been watching Better Call Saul since that started up again, and I'm so excited about that. I think we'll talk about that later. Fargo has started. Love, loved, loved the first two seasons of that. So I'm very excited about the new season. Justified. I've been keeping up with you guys on that. I had to catch up because I was oh, behind. Fantastic. And I'm glad I did because season six has redeemed itself already. Uh, you've talked about watching Doctor Who and your thoughts on Doctor Who. I have been watching Doctor Who for a long time. I am... Not really a fan of Capaldi, uh, also known as Marbles in His Mouth Doctor. And so I know this is his last season. I'm kind of glad that we're going to get someone new to see where that goes. They also have a spinoff 
that I've been watching called Class. And that's pretty good, actually. That has a chance. So I might watch that. That's off of BBC eight episodes in the first series of that. And then just regular uh, TV like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Amazon or, or Amazon's. Uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> I miss the amazing race, which is like my kind of I would say. Uh, you know, that's the thing that I sheepishly admit that I watch, you know, it, it's that show that I don't like to admit to, but I have, that's, that's like the night it's on. I have to watch that. Now, the thing that's probably most interesting is I most recently watched the Oasis pilot. That's one of the new uh, pilot shows on, uh, I think it is Amazon. And I really enjoyed that. Very cool. Uh, you know, I've been watching a lot of those same things. Better Call Saul, Fargo, uh, Doctor Who, uh, which, like you mentioned, we, we've talked about. I, I liked episode two as much as I liked episode one. Had a very uh, uh, Tenant feel to the plot. Again, I, I can almost match it up to a couple of different David Tennant era episodes that they felt like they were emulating. But I like the emoji thing happening. Uh, enjoyed the season finales of both The Expanse and Magicians. But the one thing, oh, I, and I did watch Silicon Valley's premiere, which I think is maybe one of its strongest seasons yet, just from that first episode. I, I really like the the. It's still funny, but there is a a very real plot twist where the founder of the company leaves the company he founded because they want to pivot to doing something else, and he's not interested in doing it anymore. Uh, and and I think that's that's a reality that I've I've seen happen before. But I had Friday evening to myself. I had two, a new dog that I had to keep an eye on and train. So I didn't want to watch anything that I had to pay super close attention to. And I have never seen the original animated Beauty and the Beast. Wow. No. So I watched that Friday night. And? And I'm like, I know all these songs just from osmosis, <laughs> you know, yeah, from being sure. around them. And wow. They, I know that avowedly they were going for a classic look at the time, but it really looked older than 1991. Yeah. Well, and I really resonated with that image in that if you're ugly, you don't deserve to be loved unless you're so courteous that somebody takes pity on you and loves you, even though you're, you're ugly, in which you'll be rewarded with oh, becoming beautiful again. Oh, see, I took it more again. as if someone's horrible to you, just keep being nice to them. <laughs> Because you love them. <laughs> well, because you'll grow to love them, even though yeah. they're horrible. And don't worry, your love will make them well, you'll more change attractive. Them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Just get but... married. They're fixer-uppers of husbands. <laughs> this is a healthy way to have a relationship, is what they're saying, right? Just remember that Disney didn't invent the fairy tale. They merely executed <laughs> they it. They only but... perfected it <laughs> and weaponized it. <laughs> you guys are cynics. Uh, Brian Brushwood, what have you been watching? Uh, all the usual suspects. Uh, watch Better Call Saul, episode 302. Watched it twice because I watched it, like Bonnie said, I'm done with Better Call Saul. It's just not taken to me. And I got halfway, th I, I watched all of it, and I'm like, yeah, just let me show you the highlights of this one. And then we watched the last half, and then uh, we'll talk about how it went from there. Justified uh, 602, Leftovers 302. I got started on Fargo, uh, to be honest. From what I understand, the first episode is all place setting anyway, so I'll let you guys spoil me. Did you get far enough to see Nora show up? No. From Leftovers? Oh, wait, in The Leftovers? Carrie Coon is in Fargo, yeah. Uh, oh, in Fargo. Oh, got it. No, no, I didn't. I did not. I did not. Okay. Um, but uh, but also, hey, remember last week when uh, Bonnie and I thought uh, that was the season finale of The Expanse? And you're like, no, right. it's and not. Right, and I was like, no, there's one more episode. Right, uh, well, I totally forgot uh, to, <laughs> to make it a priority, and so we didn't watch it. So I'm actually to... a little jealous of you that you still get to watch the season finale. Okay, great, great. Well, I look yeah. forward to it. I told Bonnie today, I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you. It was kind of a finale. We didn't watch the finale. Uh, this was a very, very busy week. And most importantly, I watched the first episode and a half so i'm all yeah i don't know halfway through episode two of mst3k i owe a huge apology because when i first started episode one i watched the opening i'm like oh okay that's cute and then like i watched the first like three jokes that that just didn't land for me and and of course mst3k is is a million at bats and one of them will be a home run 
at some point, I, like, I just had it on. It was the perfect thing to have on while I'm playing um, uh, Hearthstone because I'm not totally invested in either, and, and it's fine for me to divert attention. And at some point, my daughter hops in my lap, and I'm like, hey, and it was weird to explain MST3K to a nine-year-old. And, and I'm just like, hey, these people show really horrible movies. They make fun of them. Watch. She got hypnotized, and there was one moment where a guy jumps up and his mouth goes wide, and all three of the characters uh, uh, lip sync going, ah! and it, 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 it just was the funniest thing she'd ever seen in her life, and she instantly got addicted. So I'm watching all of that with the kids. It's fantastic. Oh, that's really cool. Bryce, what have you been on the lookout for? Hey, guys. I uh, you, you may have seen on Netflix, Bill Nye Saves the World finally yeah. premiered. Uh, there's 13 half-hour episodes. I got to say, uh, I, I was a little a little hot and cold on it, but there's a, there, there, I, I think that there is a place for this show. I think there is an audience for this show, uh, despite some of my, my, my misgivings about it. But it, it touches on a lot of critical topics that are that are – uh, really important to our world right now: global warming, vaccinations, sex and gender identities. Uh, and Bill is super, super passionate, almost sometimes to the point of being a little uh, abrasive about it. But it's it's a a show that tries to take basic science and and re relate it to these incredibly important topics. Uh, and there are a bunch of guest stars. The first the first episode has got uh, the rapper designer in it, uh, and they just keep making a bunch of panda jokes, which is actually like they, pretty good. Um, but I, I will say, like, if you consider yourself already sort of informed on on some of these issues, they they may seem a little shallow in, in terms of like how they handle them and and the the depth of. of knowledge that they go into but I, I think if you are genuinely interested on in some of the topics that they talk about i think I, I think you really will get something out of it um because i know i watched i watched the first two episodes for for this review and came away thinking there was a lot that i didn't like and then there was a lot that really like was was very interesting and intriguing um so i i, I say give a give it an episode or two and, and see where you land on it right uh, sometimes the celebrity cameos make sense, and sometimes it's DJ Steve Aoki doing litmus tests for some reason. <laughs> so, uh, like actual litmus tests, yes, like 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 measuring well, pH. That's acid yeah. House, uh, Acid yes. House. No, that's right. <laughs> and I'm sure someone at Netflix said that, um, and that's why. But I don't think most people. I don't think most Netflix people will know who Steve. Aoki or is it all is. about oh. that base? I don't know. Oh Jesus. All right. <laughs> That's Bill Nye Saves the World. It's on Netflix now. <laughs> hey, folks, if you got something we should be on the lookout for, besides those bad jokes, email us, cordkillers <laughs> at gmail.com. Uh, all right, real quickly, uh, Brian and I like to tell you about other projects we're doing uh, to keep ourselves going from time to time. And, of course, I've mentioned my novel Pilot X, which is about a time traveler. It's very well-reviewed on Amazon.com. You can get it there. You can get it at Barnes & Noble. You can get it at bookstores around the world. Uh, in fact, Turkey, if you know Turkey from the Phileas Club, uh, he bought some copies, got me to sign them, uh, and he's giving them away to folks in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf Coast countries who couldn't get a hold of one otherwise. So there's all kinds of cool stuff going around around pilot x uh it's on audible.com as well and if you're saying tom yes i already bought it and read it check out one of my other books at tommeritbooks.com heck yes let's move on to the front lines front lines Netflix announced that it plans to raise 1 billion euros in order to fund original content. If you don't know the exchange rate, that's still close to a billion dollars, a little over a billion dollars. Company indicated in its latest earnings that it would use a debt offering to raise money for original content, but it hadn't stated the amount. Now we know the amount. Heck yeah, man. Um, I, I got to be honest. You, you hear 1 billion. And, and as you and I spoke about before the show, I'm like, that's a lot of money. You could build a bridge across the Gibraltar Strait for that. Uh, <laughs> probably not. Probably $10 billion. Uh, But uh, but uh, that's remarkable that they're in a position to command that kind of money. But then you seem to feel like it's more remarkable if they couldn't. Yeah. I mean, Netflix is strong enough right now. If they couldn't raise this kind of money, uh, it would be a shock. Uh what the gamble is, is that they can spend, they can plow all this money into original content such that people will be so loyal to Netflix and flooding to Netflix around the world, not just in the U.S., that they'll make this money back consistently over time. Yeah. 
Meanwhile, HBO Go apps for iOS and Android will start listing the next episode uh, to watch and auto-playing the next episode in a series if you take no action. That's something that HBO Now has done for a while. I never really allow HBO Now to... I, I don't allow any of them to go on to the next thing. What about you, Richard? No, neither do I. No, yeah. I hate this. I, this is a feature I wish I could turn off in Netflix. I, I do not like this feature. What's more interesting is that it's finally going to remember where you were in the last show you watched, which it didn't do before, and I can't believe that. Uh, and this is just HBO Go, different than HBO Now, so it depends on how you get your HBO. Uh, you can turn this off in Netflix. You can turn it off in your profile settings. Oh, I have to do that right after we're done. No, I, I disagree, <laughs> man. I, I went back and revisited uh, Always Sunny in Philadelphia. I got caught up on the last season. It was great. One ended, the next one started. It's awesome. Malaysia's <laughs> iFlix is a $3 a month streaming service targeting emerging markets. It's announced its first roster of original content. Uh, one of them will be called Magic Hour, an eight-part series based on the 2015 Indonesian hit film and has the same two lead actors. There's also an eight-part unnamed comedy series that will have localized versions with separate hosts and separate contestants in Malaysia, the Philippines, and Indonesia. Oh, that's brilliant. Uh, yeah. Sling TV's cloud DVR is now accessible on its Apple TV app. The service is $5 a month. Subscribers get 50 hours of video storage for channels that allow it. Yeah, so Sling TV, Cloud DVR, slowly moving to all the apps. Not sure why it didn't just launch on all the apps, but I guess they have to update them, separate code bases, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and following exactly. a similar deal that we mentioned last week uh, that NBC did, Disney has now reached a deal with its affiliates, 160 plus ABC affiliates, to negotiate streaming deals on behalf of the local stations that it doesn't own. It already negotiated on behalf of the stations it owned. Now it's got a deal to negotiate on behalf of the affiliates. This should make it easier for more local markets to be added to services like Sling TV and PlayStation View. I mm -hmm. have no opinion about that. I do. This is a nice way of saying it circumvents the affiliates. I still do not understand why in this day and age we have affiliates. It makes no sense in the models that we're looking at going forward. Dude, be careful. We have a lot of over-the-air antenna people who are very happy to be getting their We signal. have a lot of people who work for the local affiliates who are like, oh, I could tell you I, a good reason because it's my I, job. <laughs> I totally understand that. And there's still an, a technical need for it today, but I don't believe that there's a need for branding it. I really don't. I don't think people care well, anymore. I, it is a model that's going to have to change. Uh, and, and this seems to indicate which way the winds are blowing, which is, yeah, your local station probably needs to be around for public affairs, for news, for local weather and things like that. Uh, and local television stations do very well with their websites in some cases uh, because yep. they are a competitor to the local paper as far as news and, and information for your local community. Uh, but the affiliate part that you're talking about, the network affiliation part is something that the affiliates need because it's a money revenue source, but isn't necessary anymore. Uh, and right. that's that's going to have to be figured out. And this is part of the, the, the way to figure it out. All right, let's move on to the dispatches from the front. Derek uh, wrote in with an excellent detailed me email. We'll have it in our show notes uh, about advertising. Derek works in the biz. You may recognize his name from previous emails. We've had him on the show before. If I may summarize, uh, he says folks are still buying TV in part because they still want to reach mass audiences for things like awareness and brand alignment and positioning. So it's not direct response. It's not, I need you to buy the thing. The reason Coke advertises on the Super Bowl is so that you feel a certain way about Coke or, or lesser known companies will advertise so that you've heard of them uh, before. As for targeting, the one huge challenge that faces advertisers comes to truly personalized creative around video. It already exists in display. You talk about tracking. He has a lot about tracking in here. Banner ads do everything from change the copy, change the image, change the color based on what they know about the user that they're serving the ad to. But video ads are much harder to pull off that kind of customization for. They're expensive to film and produce, much harder to execute in a way that would be unique to users while maintaining creative integrity. He says we'll probably see advances to make this more feasible in the future, but we're still a bit away from this. I'll tell you what, uh, in defense of traditional advertising, um, there is no amount of uh, coordinated or direct response or 
uh, uh, user targeted ads that will cause um, the phenomenon that I get when I'm at an airport and I walk up to a bar and then finally they're about to serve me because they're super busy and they ask me what I want. Um, the odds are good that a sports channel is on. And if there's a game, there's a good chance that if they're on commercial break at the exact moment, I am saying what beer I want them to give me that over their shoulder, I will see Bud Light uh, being poured in there. And it's like, like <laughs> that is something that you cannot create with any kind of direct response marketing. And so in that regard, I, I can understand that, you know, not that they're going to make back their money from that particular experience, but it certainly ups the possibility of them inducing an actual user experience with the object in the moment. Chris wrote in and says, Spectrum recently took over from Time Warner where he lives. He says, I went to the local office and asked what they could do to lower my bill. The rep noodled around on his keyboard and ended up knocking about $40 a month off by, get this, adding HBO, Cinemax, and Showtime. How can this be? Now, Game of Thrones, Veep, Silicon Valley, Last Week Tonight, as well as Billions and Homeland are available without delving into the dark side of streaming. Speaking... Of the dark side of streaming, I haven't heard anything from you guys about the stink regarding preloaded Cody boxes in the UK and on Amazon. Any thoughts? Uh, yeah, the thought is you don't listen to cord killers enough because we've been very clear that these are boxes filled with pirated uh, to or pirating tools, and that's that. Uh, uh, I mean, we we could we could uh, 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 stamp our feet over it, but uh, yeah, I mean, we addressed that particularly, and and we we don't talk about a lot of the off-brand boxes out there simply because a lot of them overpromise and underdeliver. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, uh, user known only by Irobox or Iro Irobox Irobox says, "I heard you talking about day and date release of Netflix." Uh, uh, movies like the upcoming Bright and saying that it would be no problem for movie theater chains to agree to day and day deals instead instead of a window of exclusivity. This may be true if the movie is good, but if the movie bombs, the theater chains will now be left out in the cold. Today, even if a movie bombs, the exclusivity window ensures that the movie advertising campaign will draw a crowd to the theaters. Without the exclusivity, the risk from a movie bombing is now absorbed by theater more directly. If movie theaters accept this deal, it sets a precedent that moving forward they will have to risk absorbing these losses from movies that bomb, which can be significant. I don't see uh, movie theater chains accepting that risk without getting something in return. What Netflix can offer them does not seem clear to me, uh, to which I say, um, perhaps I was not clear in, in, my, in, in my proposal of a scheme, in which case uh, uh, Netflix sends out an email saying our new thing premieres, you want to see it with a crowd, click here, get your reservation, and then they, they hit up all the movie theaters saying, hey, we have completely sold out audiences for four showings on Thursday night. If you would like, you can bump your bottom four performing movies, which again, this costs them nothing because it's all distri digital distribution. And instead of having movies, uh, showings with 20 people in the audience, you can have 400 people in the audience. We will replace them uh, for as long as it is profitable. And the moment it's not, uh, then they could, they could swap again. Yes, it would be disastrous if they cleared out and promised an entire week to a movie, but they don't have to do that anymore. Movies can, ch theaters can change day to day to day to day to day. The only thing they can't do is they couldn't promise uh, entire theaters of showings at particular times, which I think is a small, uh, you know, more than two or three days in advance, which I think is a small trade-off. Richard, what do you think about all this? Yeah, I liked what you were proposing, actually, Brian. I think that's an interesting idea because so far the, the two biggest... Uh, titles, and I say that, you know, kind of tongue in cheek, that have really gotten any press for this, I would think are probably Bubble, uh, wow, nearly eight or nine years ago, and then Tower Heist. And both of those oh, were, geez, Tower Heist. Were, were flops. They fall into this category that um, they're talking about here, even with names like Sondheim be, be, uh, behind Bubble. So I just, I think we need to think more creatively in how we get the theaters and online services to work together better. And that's why I liked what you had proposed. Uh, you know what it is, is really, and I'm not saying anything new. I'm just basically proposing just-in-time management of movie media inventory right. to distribution centers uh, where they can sell popcorn. Theaters are afraid to do that, though, because... Uh, while it may make sense to you and it makes sense to me and probably makes sense to Netflix, 
the theater looks at it as if I do that for Netflix, then every studio will want that. And it undermines my entire system, which is based on what I Rob X is saying of exclusivity that forces people to go to the theater to see a movie that they saw advertised. And so they don't want to allow Netflix to do that. They'll allow the the uh, the I Fathom events, the Fathom events folks to do it because those things aren't competition to their other movies. But it doesn't set a precedent. They're so afraid of saying, I'll let Netflix do something and it undermining their entire business model, which is exactly yep. what every company that's been disrupted by the internet has done. Like, I'm not gonna do anything that disrupts my existing business model. <laughs> so it's going to happen to them eventually. There just needs to be a graceful way to do it. And I think what iRobX brings up is maybe another way to get to that system that Brian's talking about, because that does seem like one of the more rational systems to end up at, which is that just-in-time management of theaters. What if it's Netflix saying, we will advertise. We will tell people to go to the theaters. We will direct market email to our subscribers who could watch it at home and tell them why why it would be so great to go to the theaters. We'll fill in that gap. We'll turn the bomb into a better box office by pushing people uh, because that that's why bombs make money is because there is so much advertising out there that gets people excited to go out to the theater. So so maybe it's it's, you know, if you let us do this part, we'll do this other part for you. Could be. Could be. Uh, finally, Amar says, I listen to Cord Killers live sometimes on the Echo Dot via the Diamond Club FM number one channel on TuneIn. It also airs on Alpha Geek Radio channel three. The podcast also is on TuneIn, but doesn't update as quickly as the Cord Killers RSS does. Uh, that's probably a little bit of lag. We, we publish late Monday night. It definitely has showed up by Tuesday morning. But Amar says, after a bit of Googling, I found that Google Home doesn't support podcasts from TuneIn, and I couldn't find the Cord Killers podcast on Google play which is home's only supported podcasting platform you're not the first person to say that so i put a link to cord killers on google play in our show notes let me know if for some reason that doesn't work for you because we are definitely there and when i search google play i find it i wonder why it's not showing up for everybody but maybe this direct link will help you if if he's doing yeah. it via the echo dot my guess is he's trying to do voice search mm -hmm. he's doing google home or Google Homes, excuse me, which is, is still another voice-based uh, service. You may want to try searching for Cord Killers All Audio because that's how mm -hmm. the RSS feed is, is delineated between All Audio and then Video Cord Killers and, and Spoiler Time separate. So yeah, which, uh, curious which by the way, it. I've been reconsidering our position on either doing audio or video. It seems like maybe we should offer, you know, like, not a silent film version, but maybe a video. I'm making a joke. I'm sorry. It's, <laughs> it's me, meanwhile, Bryce is like, the hell are you yeah. talking Put about? Put the pitch for <laughs> No, I, the thing is, I'm talking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would say we had either audio or video, but not both. That's That was the joke. Oh. Never mind. When I read this listener's message, I tried to see if I could get my echo to play your show. And I don't listen to my podcasts using the echo. And I tried maybe seven or eight different ways to try and get it to play. And the only way that I could get it to play was actually to use my app from Amazon and find it in TuneIn and then it would play it. I could not get it to come up by voice. And I wonder if that's because technically Cord Killers isn't a word and it's having a hard time reconciling that. Oh. Maybe, yeah. That could happen to the Google Home as well. Uh, right. Which is what Amar's having problems with. So uh, anyway... Hopefully this link will help in some way. Maybe you can insert it that way. Uh, that is it for us. Once again, thank you, Richard Gunther, for joining us. It's a pleasure having you. Yeah, thank you very much. This was a lot of fun. I'm glad I could join you tonight. Let folks know a little bit more about what's going on at the digitalmediazone.com. Absolutely. So we cover all things kind of home media, and we really started out as a DIY home theater site. And that evolved into smart home tech as well. I host two shows there, Entertainment 2.0. And I host that with uh, my co-host, Josh Pollard. That's about entertainment technology in the Microsoft world. We talk about audio, video, gaming on Xbox, Windows, and mobile platforms. And then Home On is a show that I host called, about uh, DIY home automation and control. And we have guests from the industry including product company CEOs, industry experts, journalists. In fact, my next episode, my co-host is Molly Wood talking about why smart home tech is so dumb. That 
Sounds unmissable. Uh, go, folks, check it out, <laughs> thedigitalmediazone.com. Uh, our website here is cordkillers.com. Our email address is cordkillers at gmail.com. We're live on diamondclub.tv Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. We will talk to you next time. Hey, guys. Tom and Brian here. We just wanted to say thank you to all of our $5 patrons who keep us loud, live, and independent. You guys make Cord Killers the production that it is. Your name appears in the video credits and appears in our hearts. And if you'd like to become one of them or see who they are, you can go to patreon.com slash cord killers. You'll need to do more than just go there, though. You'll have to sign up and, you know, pledge an amount. But Unless you just want to see who they are. Well, I mean, you can gawk. That's a little creepy, isn't it? If you want to be a gawker, let's go. Up to you. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>